All right, and I'm recording as well. Okay, great. Great. Hi, welcome back to another episode of Scorpio Season TV. Uh, we're here today with Lisa, um, and I'm here today with my guest, Ben Cat. Hey, Lisa. I'm here with my guest, Lisa. <laughs> uh, Venkat, I hear you're, um, you've got a snack today. What are you eating? So today I'm eating edamame, E for edamame. Right, because today is our e day, right? Cool. Yep. Um, let's see, so we've got a short list of um, topics today. Uh, maybe I'll just read them off and then we can kind of uh, start picking through, picking our way through them. Um, energy, eigenstates, entropy, emergency, and evilness. Um, All right. Lots of E's. Lots of E's. Um, where right. should we start? So energy, obviously, and since you are in Texas, right in the middle of oil country, take us off. What yeah, energy. Mean? So, okay, so energy has been in the news a lot lately um, for a couple for reasons. One reason is that we're not using as much of it as we usually do. Um, and the ways that I've seen that kind of come out are like, there's not as much pollution around. I don't know if you can like directly tie that to energy, but I'm going to, um, cause it takes energy to make pollution. So the fact that there's not as much pollution around, um, the other reason that it's been in the news is that oil prices have cratered. Um, the reason that oil prices have cratered is kind of twofold. Um, one is that as with there being no pollution, we're not using as much energy. So the market demand is like, basically, I think I saw some quote that was like, uh, it's down like 25% or something like that. Um, I think it bounced back a little, but at one point it was down even further than that, I thought. Um, but yeah. It's a, a lot. lot. I mean, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but for oil specifically, I mean, nobody's, not as many people are driving, like car usage is way down. Um, if fact, I don't know how many people factories run on gasoline if that makes sense um well indirectly but, a lot of them do right because even if it runs on electricity most electricity in sort of heavy industrial areas tends to be produced by like fossil natural fuels so gas. Not, not oil yes yeah, natural, natural gas, gas and, coal. and coal but i don't think that they burn i don't think that oil is used for like energy production for like heart heavy industry you use it for transportation mostly is my understanding i think at one point they used to have heavy oil based uh, generators but i don't know if they're still if they still exist but at one point in history there were heavy oil based electricity generators but yeah anyway so oil's down and i think it's all a correlated market right so when oil goes down all the fossil fuels go down together i think Kind of I like believe when that Bitcoin goes down, all the cryptos go down together with Bitcoin. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Um, yeah. But so like, so again, so production went down as we, as we were saying. And then the other reason that oil prices dropped off a cliff is because um, they doubled, I don't know if they doubled, but they increased production from Russia and um, Saudi Arabia got into a bit of a turf war around the yep. same time. I want to say this happened in January, end of, like end of January, early March. Um, yeah, that was interesting. And it, it's like, uh, this was news, news to me that even though they're supposedly part of the same cartel, Russia has never actually cut back production along uh, the lines that uh, OPEC um, wanted. So it was kind of a one-way deal. It was always Saudi Arabia making the cuts. Russia kind of pretended to play along, but they never actually made cuts. And I think both got kind of sick of like subsidizing American natural gas. <laughs> so they're like, screw that. We are going to take the market demand and kill the American industry. Interesting. Yeah. So this puts American shale producers. It's the, so my exact understanding of it isn't totally up to date, but I might be wrong about this, but I, I understand that the United States of America since, so the Obama administration actually, funded the technology that led to the development of the fracking industry in the United States and the shale, um, like in the Midwest, there's like shale deposits mm -hmm. that they now produce. Um, I believe they're exporting like oil from, right? Um, like Permian Basin oil. So in the last decade, the United States went from an importer of oil product to exporter, is my understanding. Yeah, it's really weird because oil is in some sense the other sort of reserve currency of the world. 
And I've never quite understood yeah. why OPEC and yeah. Russia would prop up oil prices and give America basically a free premium to sell its uh, oil. It's like almost a gift to America. And uh, it's not quite clear why they would give America a gift, but that's, uh, I guess that puts my expertise on oil economics somewhere in between low to medium. <laughs> it's, yeah, expertise. Is that a, that was on our list, but it's not anymore. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, anyways. So that's what's been going on with the oil industry right now. Um, so now there's just a bunch of... So Russia is pumping. My understanding is that Saudi Arabia is also pumping. Yeah, they're the ones um, who started it. Like it's a game of chicken and Saudi Arabia is the one that uh, went first, I think, and started over pumping. Like one theory I heard, which I don't know how credible it is, is that now that they see the oil end game already starting, they are trying to do like a harvesting the market market share grab. So it's like there's maybe a decade or two left before everybody tries to transition off oil. And in that period, what they want to do is lock down long-term futures contracts at the biggest market share they can, because it's like at some point, the demand will not just temporarily crash because of a virus, but permanently crash because everybody's transitioning off, right? So Saudi Arabia, I think, wants mm-hmm. to, it's like carve up the pie chart for the rest of the oil history right now. I understand. So yeah. this is like, I see. So this is like, you the, you win or you lose here because after this, there's no more game. Like this is, this is it. Yep. So, Fascinating. Yeah. That's really interesting. Um, yeah. I like, yeah. Especially yeah. the big customers, like one I heard was India tends to buy oil in like big long-term futures contracts. So these things are not mm. like day-to-day auction broker type deals. They're like nation-to-nation deals that are worked out for like years in advance at like certain prices. So yeah, that's interesting. Oh, but speaking of energy, I was reminded of one more thing. Weren't you at one point doing some sort of weird monitoring with an app that tells you your energy usage? Oh yeah. It was you tweeting. So what's oh, that's that about? Me. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. So the whole thing is, um, how much of this do I want to talk about? Right. So (laughs) one of the reasons that I, yeah, so I run cryptocurrency miners in my my garage, um, Mm -hmm. which use energy and I live in Texas. Texas has a deregulated, um, electricity market at the state level. What that means is that there's a variety of varying energy companies of like varying scam levels. They provide you electricity, <laughs> but like the like pricing tiers that they set up are like incredibly game. Like they're just, yeah. Anyways, you sign up, but basically you sign up for like year long or six month or moment to moment contracts where you can mm-hmm. pick whatever company you want and they all have different terms and different rates and different ways that you can pay less money electricity depending on exactly when your usage is and all these things. Um, and there's one, one um, so the, excuse me, the provider that I moved on to is called Gritty. Um, sorry, Gritty. They, they're probably, I would say they're probably the most like modern in the that they have like an iPhone app that I download and have like information about my usage on my iPhone app, which is fun. Mm-hmm. Um, but they also give you direct access. So unlike the other ones, which are a flat contract, um, you gritty charges you by the wholesale price. So whatever, so like Texas energy market is run by this consortium called ERCOT, E-R-C-O-T, okay. energy regulator commission of texas or something like that um but every five minutes so they have like a couple different auctions so similar to like how india has an auction like an auction right and they bid and they get a contract and they have it for like x amount of time the energy market in texas is such that you can either i think buy nightly contracts so you can buy energy for the next day there's like a market where you show up and you're like you're like let's say you're a grocery store and you need x amount of electricity to run all of your um Mm -hmm. whatever you go to the wholesale commercial market or whatever I don't know if exactly how this works, but you can buy electricity on like the daily thing. I think you can do it on the hour or there's like five minute spot prices. So every five oh, minutes okay. there's an auction mechanism that the price of electricity changes and that is totally dependent on the supply and the demand. So it, it fluctuates. And the idea is that it, it can go all the way up to $9 a kilowatt hour, which is very expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Is that right? I think that's right. Yeah. 
so, so you you're basically around, wait like, for it to time. get cheaper than the um, average yield of your Bitcoin miners and then turn on your miners when it's cheap enough. Is that what you do? Yes. So <laughs> Gritty, okay, right. So Gritty, basically Gritty gives you access as a consumer to the five minute spot price uh -huh. market. So my electricity is whatever the spot price is. And you typically it's cheaper than average. Every once in a while there's spikes though and I run around and turn everything in the house <laughs> off. Um, it really sucks when it's hot out. It really sucks on, so like, like, so now I have a very intimate understanding of where electricity prices kind of comes from in Texas, which I didn't have before <laughs> when I was on like a black contract. Um, apparently, interestingly enough, like Texas is actually kind of ahead of the curve in terms of being having their grid run on, on renewables. Um, one of the renewables that we have here in Texas is energy, wind energy, I'm sorry, is wind. Mm -hmm. um, so there are big wind turbine plants mm -hmm. out in West Texas so on windy days electricity is cheaper but if it's hot out everyone's running their AC and there's no wind blowing you get we had so like last August there were a bunch of like couple really expensive electricity days um which kind of sucked because like I mean it's fine you know the miners don't run whatever um the other nice thing about gritty and my miners is I have like you know what if this and that is it's, it's you like you know what what is if if this, then that. It's like oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. service you can yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. I've written a couple of scripts with that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I can, I basically automated my miners on if this and that using Gritty. So like oh, it's all. That is really cool. It's, That's uh, great. So uh, give us a sense of um, like uh, what the variability looks like. So how often do your miners turn on and off in a typical day based on the if this, then that logic? I have no idea. I don't check. <laughs> I have no idea. And if like if the, if this and that doesn't trigger and I accidentally run through some really expensive time, I will that will be a very sad day. But um so hopefully it, it doesn't fall down under load or something. That would suck. Um but it, yeah, I don't know. I even got smart thermostats to try and turn it off and on, but the th smart thermostat I got didn't have a the granularity of control isn't very good. So uh, but why do you even need a uh, thermostat you have five minute spot pricing so you just check the bitcoin price and you check the electricity price and if the if it's profitable you turn it on right oh yeah it's nothing that expensive i mean my system it's not even that i just have a flat i just picked a flat number it's just oh, that you okay. can't do a lot of like your got it got it so, so i'm like if, it, if the price goes above like electricity price goes above whatever turn this like the unit off it's fine Oh, okay, got it. So you're doing a slower switching kind of thing. Uh, but what you're yeah. talking about reminds me of a couple of other interesting little, little sort of factoids. Like um, a couple of years ago, I was doing a bunch of um, energy transition renewables type consulting projects. Mm -hmm. And I learned about um, behind the meter storage. So you've heard of grid scale batteries, right? So these are these yeah. huge lithium ion batteries that are now starting to replace uh, what are known as gas speakers to balance the load curve of renewables. So instead of having gas speakers, you have big batteries. So initially people were mainly putting them next to generating plants, but now a lot of big enterprises that buy electricity, like the grocery stores that you talked about, what they do is they have these bigger batteries um, sort of behind their own metering and they just buy it up and store it uh, while it's cheap. So it's kind of interesting that in a way, whether you're doing like mining when electricity is cheap or whether you're just buying it for actual electricity use, what you're doing is like, you're running a battery like your mining is also a kind of battery you're um, storing it in the form yes. of money instead of um, uh, wattage right oh, and the other interesting yeah. anecdote that i thought of was this happened just last week so in india due to the shutdown it's a three-week shutdown the the prime minister decided to announce honestly this seems like bullshit to me but kind of like a nationwide um, uh, i guess morale boosting thing of everybody turn off your lights at 9 p.m. on Sunday and light a candle or a lamp, you know, like an oil lamp or something and stand on your window. So it, it became this sort of kind of idiotic virtue signaling thing. And the unanticipated consequence it had was all the grid managers suddenly went into a panic because if everybody's shutting off their lights at the same time, it'll suddenly, you know, uh, overload the... There's a surge the on the thing. And yeah. it created this very interesting kind of prisoner's dilemma because if your circuit breakers are not reliable, then the 
a rational thing for you to do is to shut off the mains because that way you'll protect your appliances from any surge, right? But then if you shut off your mains and you take even your like non-light appliances offline, like your refrigerator, TV, and ceiling fans, then that exacerbates the problem on the grid, which makes the problem worse. So it became this interesting nationwide test of how many people are going to turn off how much electric usage, how, uh, how severely. As it happened, the grid survived, and I don't know how they managed, but I'm sort of following that story. But yeah, energy management is really funny. Uh, yeah, and so like, yeah. yeah, as I say, yeah, as, I mean, so it's interesting because like, so something that I think this epidemic has kind of also highlighted is like communal, like community systems, right? Like mm-hmm. the interconnectedness of, of communities and like electricity grids are like communal um, goods, right? Yeah, like. Yeah you depend on the behavior of every other person on that grid in order for your electricity not to get completely fucked or like exactly. whatever, right? Um, it, it's uh, like, I mean, it's, there's an epidemiology of any grid-based system. So it's not just human-to-human contact. That's like a network. Like electricity is a basic network, right? And you can have an epidemic of outages because uh, one breaker trips and then the load moves to another backup generator. That trips and suddenly you have cascading yeah. failures and blackouts. Like the Northeast had a big blackout like that. Yeah. Was it a decade ago or something? I've now forgotten the date, but there was a huge uh, across the Northeast uh, rolling blackout because of, not a rolling blackout, but a cascade failure because of this. Uh, yeah, all sorts of fun stuff with energy and electricity and stuff. <sighs> Speaking yeah. of well, energy, yeah. yeah. I was gonna say, like, it's funny. I mean, I feel like the, um, the solution in the electricity sense is very similar to like the um, self-isolation solution. like. Yep. Um, you know, you buy a home battery and you have like battery at home and then you can isolate yourself from the grid as the grid goes down, you're fine because you have like a backup battery on prem. Oh yeah, totally. That's um, actually a huge trend in the energy business. It's the microgrid revolution. Have you heard the term microgrid? Yeah. Oh That's yeah. That's basically yeah, totally. it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I was trying to get a Tesla. I really wanted to get solar panels and install them in my house <laughs> and get a, a Tesla power wall. Yeah, I like I was looking into it. It didn't work out because of my roof topology is not uh, conducive to getting panels installed. Sadly, um, you should do it toilet, anyway. The Tesla roof, <laughs> dude. But I'd have to do I'd have to do it all myself, which I guess I could. I'd have to rent the equipment, and I I mean I guess I could. I could definitely do it. It would be a project. It sounds um, like your kind of project, to be honest. It's the it same totally thing fine. you do. <laughs> Um, I could totally be fine. But so my my backup plan was to get a Tesla solar roof, um, because you just replace your entire roof instead of like worrying about panel placement. Um, but they've turned me down because they don't like my roof either. <laughs> so I had a really sad conversation with them on the phone the other day. I don't know, arguing with them about like what my roof exactly looks like. It's fine. I think there's a lot more to talk about energy, so we should find another letter of the alphabet. P for power, maybe, and circle oh. back to it. Yeah, I mean, we can cheat yeah, a little bit good. and come back to it. But yeah, um, yeah, let's uh, talk about eigenstates now, which is kind of like energy states. I don't know, who put that on? Was that you or me? I put it on there. Okay, yeah. So uh, what were you thinking about eigenstates? I don't remember now. I don't remember <laughs> what I was talking about eigenstates. But, uh, we were talking earlier, I, you know, why... We were talking earlier about how the uh, coronavirus situation has really created an eigenstate of um, oh yeah yeah of the... infectiousness. Yeah. Uh, do you want to explain? Yeah, that was a tweet I saw. I forgot who tweeted it, but the joke goes that you both you have to act like you both have the virus and you don't have the virus. So the logic goes that you have to act like you have the virus in case you infect others. That's why you must wear masks. And you must also sort of uh, uh, avoid going out and stay at home. That's like acting like you don't have the virus because then you might be get infected and you can't assume herd immunity or whatever and go out, right? So you kind of have to act right. like you both have and don't have the virus. And the reason we are all being forced to do that is you, you can't get tested, right? Like it's still very hard to get yourself tested unless you're actually suffering and about to, I don't know, going to respiratory failure so you've been That's, trying right you've actually been trying to get tested yeah so i well by trying i mean i walked over to the health clinic close to me that i read on, online offered tests and screening um as far as i can tell the process involved so i'm like i i've had some very mild symptoms um i am 
relatively convinced that I have a mild case of it. Um, but I, there's like, one, it's hard to say that because people are like, you know, it's like, I don't have any proof. Um, I don't know where I would have gotten it from. It's not like I really can leave my house. I work from home. I've got mm-hmm. three weeks of groceries. I mean, I did go grocery shopping last week, but whatever. Um, I do have a housemate who has been going in and out a bit. Like there's definitely vectors if that makes sense, mm-hmm. but it's not like I have a coworker that got tested positive last week that I can like hold up to the health authorities. Because that's the ridiculous thing about wanting to get tested, right? Is like mm-hmm. they do a pre-screening stuff with like you know a couple of questions what are your underlying conditions what are your symptoms all that stuff and then you know like have you do you know of anyone that's tested positive for it and it's like I don't know <laughs> who's been tested for it like everyone that I've talk, <laughs> talked to that like thinks they might have had it or did have it or whatever like no one's been tested like huh. I don't know yeah, well, that suggests to me that we can actually extend the joke about the you know Heisenberg virus or Heisen virus as I think it was called there's, there's sort of like entanglement of uh, uh, tested mm. states, right? Like it's almost like if your wave function collapses and it turns out you're positive, everybody you came in contact with their wave function will also collapse in yes. something like that. So there's like a whole, I don't know. We, there's a tangled you find yourself state. into a chain that doesn't have... <laughs> You find yourself in like a chain where you can't get that like that clarity or you can't get that test done, right? Then mm-hmm. every you're just none of you know. You just don't know. Huh? Um, this actually suggests there would be a my co- symptoms aren't bad enough. Your, your symptoms aren't one. Oh, I was saying my system. I don't think my symptoms are bad enough for me to like get the hail mary. I'm in the oh, hospital. Okay. Oh, like. So, so the thing I was thinking is there might be a clever way to use this entanglement to decide who is worth testing the most, right? So imagine mm-hmm. you have a social network where everybody says, all right, how strongly do you believe you might have the virus right now, right? So do a poll. So uh, you've told me that you think you might have it. I've also been feeling sniffly for the last couple of weeks. So let's say my probability is 0. 0.02, but we haven't met each other for seven months. So you and I are not in the same sort of... Um, distance graph, but locally, you can sort of construct this graph and then you can sort of probably do an analysis of that graph and figure out, all right, if you could just test this one person, this entire wave function of the subgraph would collapse and you would have a lot more better idea because there's a lot of people on the cusp of probability, something like that. So yeah, there's probably going to be a lot of very clever testing methodologies that come out of this. Uh, but yeah, what else? I can state, what else comes to mind with that? I like, I think the part of it that's so frustrating though is like all that cleverness wouldn't have to exist if we just like <laughs> if you could just decide you wanted to get tested and go get tested right like yep that, that's always kind of um, funny about these things like this quantum mechanics which is the source of our metaphor where the uncertainty is like kind of fundamental to the fabric of reality itself but everywhere else mm-hmm. when we apply quantum mechanics as a metaphor for uncertainty it turns out that what's really going on is you haven't instrumented and added enough sensors to the thing. And if you add that, the uncertainty kind of like goes away. It's not actually a quantum system, right? I mean, yeah. in a very yeah. determined uh, but- sense, we either have or do not have the virus. It's not a superposition of crap. Well, well yeah, isn't that right? And so that's right. And that's a really interesting point about, you know, you were claiming another episode, you don't really know much about quantum stuff, but um uh but i think like you bring up a really good point about like this whole the measurability right like as soon as you can observe the thing it collapses into a particular state and so the maintaining of that yeah yeah but like you and i either do or do do not have the coronavirus and or sars cov whatever it is the technical name is and um there's a way to figure it out. We just don't have the mechanism for figuring that out. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it, there, there is like a superficial level of the analogy where the eigenstate idea works and then a deep level where it's kind of like almost a red herring and it's like, no, just test everybody as much as you can and then all this uncertainty will go away. Uh, but, but there's other aspects of um, like, uh, when I think of eigenstates and where, so I'm kind of like shifting tracks a little bit now, I'm trying mm. to think what other systems other than actual quantum mechanical systems, in fact, do have like genuine uncertainty and ambiguity of that form. And one that comes- Oh, I, from, I have one. Okay, okay, yeah, go. Okay, go ahead. 
Oh, okay, no, I'll no, just share mine as a quick one, which is the optical illusions. Like you've seen the duck and rabbit one, right? So when you're in this, when you're looking at that illusion, your mind literally is in that superposition of states. Is it a duck or is it a rabbit? Mm -hmm. There is no determinate answer to that. So that's my one example of a non-quantum system that kind of looks like that. But what's yours? Um, so my example is um, zero knowledge proofs in crypto systems. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and it, so, so like explain that to me. I, I've heard the term a few times. I know Zcash works on it, but I've never actually gone through the explainer stuff on that. Yeah, okay. So the... Um, so I'm trying to figure out how where to start on this exactly. Um, okay, so the idea that a zero knowledge proof. So a zero knowledge proof basically means that. Okay, so let's let's start with maybe a very simple example. Um, you have a bit. That bit is in the position of either zero or one, mm -hmm. um, and you're gonna sign a commitment which proves that the bit is in the state of let's say one. Okay. Um, but only certain people who know a secret a secret can um, uh, reveal what that proof says about the state of the bit, mm -hmm. whether it's zero or one. However, anyone can look at the proof and see that it is a valid proof, which means that makes it correct assertion about the current state of the bit without telling you what that state is. Ah, okay, got it. And this is why right. when so, you set up those protocols, you have to do that weird ritual of burning everything or something, right? Like uh, Zcash did that, like a right? ritual sacrifice. The witches come out at night and burn the secret keys. So that, the, yeah, like, um, that, 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 was, <laughs> that was a really funny part when this was doing the rounds a couple of years ago. Like, uh, the this is Zcash, did, right? Yeah, Zcash. They did that yeah. ritual of like smashing the hard disks or whatever the hell. So it was like, all right, what's going on here? Witchcraft? <laughs> But did they smash the disc hard enough then, Kat? There's no way to prove it. Um, yeah, so I think that has to do with like, so zero knowledge proofs tend to have a setup phase. I'm not, so this is not an area that I'm like super uh, incredibly ver expert at. I'm not an expert. This is not something I'm like very much mm -hmm. an expert at, but um, there is usually there's like a setup phase. It has to do with constructing an environment in which you can create proofs about a zero or a one if that okay. makes sense so you need like kind of like this like petri dish environment in which you can create proofs and then you can verify that the proof actually says the correct thing about the state without actually knowing what the state is unless you have the they call it like the blinding key because it reveals the answer it unblinds okay. what the proof is hiding or like making an assertion about um and it's only anyway so this is eigenstate so the reason the way that i like bring this back to eigenstate is that when you create a zero knowledge proof about a zero one you have blinded everyone except the holder of the, the unrevealing key as to their actual state of what that reality is it's definitely i guess it still kind of fits in this whole like it's definitely one or the other like like i either definitely have coronavirus or i do not have coronavirus right like that is something that yeah. you can test but it um it does kind of make it such that like only certain people have the ability to observe what reality is. Everyone else, we're still in this like 50 50 ah. could be either a one or a zero. Oh, got it. So, so, in a way, actually, your example overlaps with mine because even though the objective reality of the bit is either zero or one, since only the observer, a few uh, select observers have seen it and nobody else can see it after that you're really talking about the mental states of other minds. So it's like, I can claim I'm looking at the optical illusion and it's a duck or rabbit. And I can say, I see a duck and you can kind of see that the two possible states are duck and rabbit, but because we are talking about my subjective knowledge of it, in that sense, it's right. sort of uh, properly quantum. <laughs> right. Well, so, so like you get, right. So you can, well, you can prove that it is either a duck or a rabbit. But it's proved like it's mm -hmm. provable that it's either a duck or a rabbit. You just don't know which one. Only certain select people have that observational yeah. capacity, so to speak. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. This is pretty esoteric stuff. Uh, but while we are on E and eigenstates, um, uh, I also really love the idea of entanglement, which is also an E. And uh, mm -hmm. I was thinking right now about, so, um, again, sort of randomly switching topics here a bit. 
but I was thinking right now about um, Beetlejuice, the red giant star that people were wondering, is it going to go supernova in February? I don't know if you were tracking that story. So it's this red giant star that's somewhere between 500 to 800 light years away. And when, before the virus hit, that was kind of a hot topic of conversation amongst nerds. Of, is this going supernova? It turns out it wasn't. It was like dust clouds or, or whatever. But the uh, reason people were wondering was it's a variable star that varies in brightness. And uh, it was going extremely dim suddenly. And that people thought that might be a sign that it was about to go supernova. But since it's like um, about 700 light years away, average of the estimates, I was actually doing the math and it turns out that that was around the time of the Black Death. And I was like, all right, if we're doing astrology and this is a prediction and an omen of a plague, if you are actually doing it relativistically, it's an omen of like the Black Death. But if you think it's happening now, it's an omen of the coronavirus. And then I got to thinking, would there be a way to do a quantum entanglement type uh, uh, way to communicate instantaneously whether or not it's exploded. And um, I concluded that you probably couldn't do it. But the scheme I had was you start with two entangled particles on Earth and one goes off on a spaceship to Betelgeuse. And if Betelgeuse ever explodes, it, um, you switch the polarity of your particles somehow. And because of mm -hmm. entanglement, the one on Earth switches. And that's a signal that Betelgeuse just exploded and you get the warning 700 years before light speed people. So I, I don't know if that scheme works because you already preset the meaning of the signal. Would that work? I don't know. So I think this goes back to like, okay, so if you, so if, if we kind of interpret your, um, how do I like, hmm, I'm not sure this is like a good digression. Is it a good, well, um, so I was going to say like, so like that whole entanglement thing, right? The reason that the particles are entangled is that we haven't decided which universe we exist in yet. Do we exist in the universe in which they're spinning with the left polarity or the right polarity, for example? So they stay entangled until they encounter, until we arrive in a universe in which they the polarity has been decided, right? Um, so the reason that the communication is instantaneous is not because they've communicated, but because we've arrived in a particular universe. Um, right. So it's like a, you, you, you arrive in a universal state, which in that universe, there's only one way that the polarity could be, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, yeah. So anyways, it's not communication, it's universe selection, which is what is happening. Um, okay, so it can't respond to real-time events like a star exploding or something. Like, as I understand, well, you'd have to. I, I actually don't think it's possible. That's why I was trying to find out. I don't. Think I think you so. could use it as a communication method, but the communication mechanism that you're using is universe selection, not like um, particle travel. I, I thought my understanding, from my understanding of this uh, stuff at a pop science level, that you can only because. Uh, you can do quantum cryptography, but you can't actually do um, uh, faster than light communication using the scheme, right? I just don't see where my particular idea breaks down, but I thought the- I think you uh, could. I think you could. could. You could do faster than light communication like this? Yeah, but it's not faster than anything. It's universe selection and it doesn't travel anywhere. You just okay, arrive okay. in that reality. Okay. All right. So, okay, got it. So the people who live in the universe in which Beetlejuice exploded, for mm -hmm. them, so, uh, that universe would get selected, but the people who are not in that universe, it's like, okay, that's, that's okay. So I'm sort of way beyond my <laughs> expertise level on this. So I'm not sure either of us is right or confused, but okay. I, I, mean, don't, I don't think, I know what I'm talking about necessarily either, but yeah. Uh, but I, I, the reason I'm a little doubtful is I remember reading in the last pop science thing I read about this like a decade ago, that act, you can't use mm -hmm. the scheme for faster than light communication. You can only use it for crypto, uh, like quantum secure cryptography. But I never quite understood the argument. But anyway, probably somebody will comment in, on this podcast and explain it to both of us. <laughs> Is, if you can keep them entangled. Yes, I think, I believe that I've read, I think I've seen papers where they've done fast to then like communication using entangled particles. Like I truly believe that is a thing. And the reason okay. the mechanism okay. that they're using yeah, is they're yeah. not using, they're not using travel through space. Yeah, they're using should, uh, universe selection mechanic. Oh, this is perfect for next um, 
week, right? EF. So we can talk about faster than yeah. communication next week. So we'll circle back mm -hmm. after we figured this out. Yeah. Okay. Because that would be <laughs> awesome. Like um, faster than light communication, if that's possible, you could do uh, what's that uh, device that uh, is in Ursula Ligon's uh, novels? Um, Are they Ansible? Uh, the Ansible, right? Else? Yeah, the Ansible. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So that's also, I think, um, what's his name used it in uh, Ender's Game. Uh, but yeah, that's yes. faster than light, right? Yeah. yeah so let's talk about faster than light next um, Ooh, week. Okay. So that should be fun. Faster than light travel and comms. But okay, what do we have on E on our list as our next job? We have, oh, what else do we have? We have entropy, which is the opposite of, of communication to some extent, right? Isn't it the um, entropy, is my, in my understanding, is a tendency towards chaos, right? It's the yeah. tendency of every possibility to be explored. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, uh, it's like over the years, uh, so I've sort of gone back and forth on do I understand entropy or do I not understand it? Mm. <laughs> and it's like, it keeps varying up and down. So, um, but, but there's lots of, um, so some of the sort of more narratively compelling understandings of entropy are really fun. Like, you know, the world goes from order to chaos, the history evolves from like um, golden age to dystopia. So those kind of fun interpretations, which are meaningless <laughs> are kind of fun. But then there's um, the, the one I like most is actually related to what you were just talking about, which is universe selection, mm. which is entropy is a measurement of, um, the arrow of time in a very particular sense. It's like you have a certain knowledge and ignorance. So we are actually getting at your subjectivity and zero knowledge stuff as well. But knowledge and ignorance can be sort of characterized as what states of the world can you distinguish? And the states of the world that you cannot distinguish that are part of like this giant pool of face space, that's kind of your zone of ignorance. And the arrow of time points from knowledge towards ignorance. And the world evolves towards that portion of face space where the states are kind of like uh, interchangeable to your knowledge state. And that's currently my favorite understanding of what entropy is. And this particular um, arrow of time explanation of entropy is one I found in Carlo Rovelli's book, The Order of Time, which is uh, one of the best pop science books I've read recently. I mean, by my standard of it should make you feel like a genius whether or not you understand it. But anyway, that's my current state of understanding of entropy. So you probably mm, have one based sense. on like software and bits and Shannon entropy or something. No, I, no? I mean, I think mine, honestly, I think mine goes back kind of to like this probability thing. Like I think that, I think that entropy is the exploration of every possibility. Um, and so every, every forward state as you move forward in time creates more possibilities. So the possibility set only gets more complex mm -hmm. in most cases. Cases, I think. Um, and so entropy is just this like constantly moving towards, I don't know, maybe that's where I'm and larger know. phase space. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think um, if any physicist hears this version of our, this episode of our podcast, they're We're going so to be so mad at both of us. <laughs> but screw them. We're going to bullshit our way around <laughs> all the topics we. <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, all right. But, um, I've only ever um, taken, no, I've taken two physics classes. I was going to say, I think I've only ever taken one, but I've taken two physics classes. I think classes. We, we both have some credibility. Like uh, my background is in mechanical engineering. So the technical introduction to entropy that I had was uh, the thermodynamics, um, classical thermodynamics course, which is, you know, yeah, I was actually going to say, you've taken thermodynamics. Yeah, I took um, engineering thermodynamics. So I have the sort of um, heat engine understanding mm -hmm. of it. And then, of course, uh, physics or physics three was uh, the quantum stuff. So I think we did a little bit of phase space kind of um, stuff there. But mm. uh, all the other stuff, my understanding is very much pop science, like, you know, reading uh, information theory at a pop science level. I, I have read Shannon's information theory original papers. So uh, mm. it's a little better than pop science. But um, yeah, that, that's another of my sort of retirement projects, which is truly try to figure out the relationship between informational entropy and uh, thermodynamic entropy because uh, first of all you sound very smart when you can talk about both at once <laughs> uh, okay entropy 
what else? Do you have any other thoughts on entropy? Not really. I have to, I have to be honest, like entropy is not a thing I think about that often. Like we should, maybe you would think it's strange as a software engineer. Like you're like, no, systems are like breaking all the time. I don't know. I don't know what, I don't know, but it's not. I mean, stuff just breaks, like things move forward. Like, no, no, no. There's, there's more fundamental relationships. Like, have you heard of uh, Landauer's principle? No, so I get to do some explaining to you. So. so Landauer's okay. principle, so Rolf Landauer was a um, computer scientist at IBM. And he basically worked on the question of does a computing system obey the second law? And it turns out it does. And it turns out if you look at like a Turing machine or any like elemental construct of computing, it turns out that the operation that increases entropy is uh, deleting a bit. So every other operation you can do at bit level, it can be isentropic. So it can be like, you know, time reversible and stuff, but deleting a bit always mm. increases entropy. So any real computing system, if you include a bit delete operation, so it, that makes it irreversible and entropic. And I think there's actually DARPA programs on what are called um, reversible computing. So ideas of computing that minimize the number of bit deletes and therefore do like a nearly isentropic um, computing. So yeah, there's a fundamental relationship between thermodynamics and computing, but I don't know that it's of much practical significance. Like, uh, and of course, the other one is much more practical, which is uh, uh, Bitcoin energy usage is uh, something all the activists like to get up in arms about. You're basically doing proof of work is uh, burning electricity into heat and using computing to mm -hmm. create more entropy. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a strong environmentalist and climate pro-climate guy, but I make an exception for Bitcoin mining. It Interesting. <laughs> Why do you make an exception? Thank God. Okay. Because I think there's kind of like a bad faith, broad brush, uh, just because techies like it, it must be bad and let's be against it kind of attitude towards those kinds of analysis. Mm -hmm. Like when people say things like, oh, the amount of energy Bitcoin uses to, you know, in a day is more than the entire country of Nigeria or something like that. When they make such sort of comparisons, there's a huge element of bad faith because when you look at what Bitcoin is in some sense an alternative to, like say the financial or banking system, that's like acres and acres of real estate full of like desks and computers and overpaid bankers trading and shit. And it's like, no, you can't make like a completely freaking made up comparison to the electricity consumption of Nigeria and Bitcoin mining. You mm -hmm. kind of have to make a fair comparison of this is a functional system that's trying to do finance a certain way. So compare it to the thing that it's trying to replace. If you think, for example, that it's a substitute for gold as a proper you know, hedge against fiat currency, then compare it to the energy intensity of gold mining and storage and transportation operations, right? So if you're going to, the, yeah. yeah, so you should be good faith about such comparisons. But also I think cryptocurrencies is really cool. And if we have to budget how much energy we use and entropy we create, cryptocurrency would be uh, up there as, all right, this is one of the top uses we should actually use energy for including air travel is another one. It's like, hey, learning to fly is one of the best things humanity ever did. And if we have to budget and ration our use of like, you know, carbon dioxide emissions, let's use our emissions budget mm. for flying around at uh, really high speed. So I, I'm kind of pragmatic about that stuff. Oh, E for environment. We touched on E for environment. We did, yeah. So what would you cut if like, okay, so let's say like, all right, Venkat, the electricity budget, you know, here's what it is, like, what would you cut out if we had to like start cutting things? You're keeping Bitcoin and keeping air travel. Like what are you letting go of? I would actually cut business travel. Like I would keep air travel for like family and people who actually want to be near each other physically. Like I have family in India. My parents are old and retired and living in India and I would like to keep visiting them. Right. So that's, I think the legitimate use of air travel, mm -hmm. but a bunch of like overpaid empty suits, you know, jetting around just to have FaceTime with uh, important right. clients because, you know, meeting the important mm -hmm. client face to face is an expensive signal. I think that's bullshit. That bullshit needs to stop. And it's this pandemic is actually a good proof of uh, concept that that stuff is not actually necessary, right? Like a lot of stuff is shutting down. But is it though? I mean, our economy shut down, Venkat. Maybe it's because the suits aren't getting to meet each other. Ah, <laughs> I think you're being sarcastic there. I don't think it's shut down because the suits are not getting to meet each other. 
they can meet on Zoom like we are doing right now. The economy is shut down because uh, uh, restaurants can't cook and serve you food in person. I mean, that's that end of the economy is the legitimately shut down one. But uh, yeah, okay. So what yeah. what else would I? I would definitely cut business travel. I would cut basically all unnecessary travel. Like air travel should be generally a luxury for um, things that actually need it, and you should pay accordingly. Like maybe we should be paying more for air travel. I don't know. What else would I shut down? Uh, I, physical retail, I think, could go away, and I don't know what the energy savings of that is. But uh, restaurants are good. Some kinds of like shopping are good, but most things should probably be e-commerce and properly staged at the last mile and stuff. Like it's amazingly expensive. Like running commercial walk uh, foot traffic real estate is really expensive, and you could do dark warehouses. Like uh, that's dark kitchens, dark everything, dark clouds. All that is energy savings. It's like any infrastructure that doesn't need glaring lights all over the place and human habitable environment control, automated. Like spaces should be run for the machines and robots that need to use that space, which is generally like one tenth the energy of having a human in that space. <laughs> yeah, I mean, humans have like very specific requirements of the environment that is like comfortable for them to operate in. Like you remove humans, you remove a lot of like environment um, management, electricity yeah, yeah. usage, so. Um, yeah, I don't know. I kind of go back to this whole like I think that I think that electricity usage is the wrong proxy for uh, environmental damage. Um, I think that I think that if anything, like Bitcoin puts a price on energy, or like it puts a um, Bitcoin rewards people who have access to low cost energy, yes. right? So in a way, renewables are going to be probably the least expensive yep. type of electricity extraction that you can get because they're renewable. Um, so if you're Bitcoin mining and your electricity is free, like you have an edge over anyone else who has to pay for the electricity, so to speak. Um, yeah. Well, though there's still the sort of um, total operating cost won't go to zero, even if the incident no, energy is yeah. zero, right? You'll be maintaining the solar panels and whatever. Oh yeah, uh, but, uh, definitely. Uh, but oh yeah, to speaking of stuff I would cut, one of them is something you like. I would cut driving. I think we drive around too much. Like I have pretty much stopped driving in the last few years and now I hate it. But you were tweeting once that you really love driving, right? And I love to drive. <laughs> I don't really drive that often, but I, I do love, I love certain kinds of driving. Yeah. I don't and know. you have a horrible driving. big Texan SUV that you drive around? <laughs> I'm sure you do. SUV? That me? No. <laughs> I like so technically I don't um technically I don't own a car. I'm borrowing oh, okay. a family car. Okay. And the family yeah. car is <laughs> an SUV or a Prius? You know, it's a small it's a small Jeep. Okay. That's acceptable. Not a small Jeep. It's I won't shame Jeep. you for a small Jeep. Jeep. Yeah. Uh, if it had been it's not like, that some small. huge one. <laughs> All right. All right. It's not the car I would pick for myself, I don't think. Really. I mean, honestly, I don't enjoy driving anymore. Like I used to enjoy it a lot. I did a lot of big road trips across the country. But some, mm. sometime after I stopped driving regularly, which was when I moved to Seattle around 2012, we had two cars then. I sold my car and my wife kept hers. Uh, but since then, it's like I just stopped and didn't miss it. And at some point I started hating it. And now it's like, uh, I drive like maybe once every month or two just to sort of stay in practice. But other than that, I, I don't miss it. It's yeah. I mean, I think honestly, when I say I like driving, I mean that I like the real time strategy game that is driving on highways in Houston. <laughs> um, like most, most driving other places is quite terrible. Um, All right, that like, you can have Grand Theft Auto and video game driving. Everybody gets yeah yeah I don't know. Anyways. all right let's go down our list we randomly did a detour through environment and we've got a covered oh yeah we've got emergency and evilness left on the uh, we do yeah oh uh, 
did I put emer I, yeah, I just put emergency on the list uh, this morning. And the reason I put that was, I wanted to flag this interesting thing that's going on with the virus, which is um, emergency rooms going bankrupt. And it's a very interesting, complicated situation because uh, apparently ambulances um, will take you to the nearest emergency room where you may not be in network coverage through your insurance plan. So then they can bill you whatever. And apparently there's not all ER doctors, but a subset of ER doctors. And this is something I just learned a couple of days ago, but a sub subset of ER doctors have apparently made it like a ongoing scam to like just bill whatever the hell, because when you're in desperate straits and showing up in an emergency room, you won't question the bills. So there's, I think all these sort of little ugly underbelly of uh, really American ugly. healthcare is going to get um, revealed. Like healthcare workers are doing a lot of great work right now, but the healthcare system as a whole is kind of full of crap like this. So ER rooms are a can of worms. Yeah, I think I was following the tweet thread where you were talking about this, or maybe yeah. you retweeted someone who had a yeah. longer. Like initially, it. I was just blaming the uh, private equity and um, you know yeah. owners of the hospital for like opting out of insurance networks and like running the ERs this way. But then somebody educated me on that and sort of informed me that a big part of the problem is the doctors themselves who kind of run it this way. So I don't know. There's again an outside my expertise zone, I mean, but it's, it's not. I was to say, it's not like medical school has a, um, has a filter for assholes, you know, like, it's not like they have a filter that's like, you can only become a doctor if you care about humanity and want to like save people, right? Like there's... Isn't there, I mean, isn't there like an, a natural sort of, what's the opposite of adverse selection? Yeah. I like guess just good selection. Like the kinds of people who often go to medical school tend to be helpful now disproportionately no like, no yeah. risk averse oh because you think they want like a lucrative profession where they can make money for sure well those kinds of people are now <laughs> probably regretting their choices and the altruistic ones are like this is the my moment so i, I, I would guess it's like a big bimodal distribution there's probably people who do it yes. for the asshole reasons and a large portion of people who do it for the pro-social um, altruistic reasons like most of the doctors i and know genuinely do care yeah yes they do yes that's true but i guess i'm saying that like it's not i think there's definitely edges in the system where if you're interested in mac maximizing your return on your med school investment they have presented themselves um something else that i think is interesting and maybe we could talk about this more under m's for monopoly is how and it kind of relates to how energy market are regulated in terms of like healthcare, like ER rooms do have a certain amount of monopoly over the emergencies that occur in their like jurisdiction, oh, yeah. right? Exactly. Um, so like treating them like these like rational things that you as a rational patient get to make rational decisions about how you're going to spend your money kind of fall apart in the emergency room situation because it is like it's like a it's like a turf thing you, wherever you just yeah. so happen to fall you end up in like a bad place right mm -hmm. um no, no. maybe we could use yeah. a little more i don't know that's kind of interesting mm -hmm. since the topic of evilness i think is the last on our list mm -hmm. and i think your priors are a lot more evil on this than i am like i think i'm less cynical about at least the medical staff in the healthcare system like i'm very cynical about the owners of hospitals insurance companies and all those other people but I, I think I might be a little idealistic about doctors and nurses, but maybe you have the right level of cynicism about them. But, uh, I mean, I mean, here's the thing. So I think people start off with intentions to do things. And I think that, I think that a lot of times, which is to say like, you know, you go into healthcare because you want to help people. Um, but I think that sometimes you end up in situations, especially if you're in a, culture of where the administrators and private equity are like taking actions that make your worldview such that the logic of the environment you find yourself in is one where profit and cost cutting mm -hmm. or like whatever is the logic of whatever then I think you come to see your job and your patients and the people you interact with a little bit differently I'm not saying that that's every hospital I think there's some really great institutions um that have set up their incentives in such a way where 
Um, like I really liked the Kaiser health. I know it's like, I'm sure it's, I know it's semi problematic sometimes, you know, there's like, it's a large organization and time you have a big health institution. I think there's always some sort of like problematic underbelly to it. I don't think you can avoid that. But um, the thing I liked about the Kaiser health system in California is that they um, did a good job of aligning their incentives, I think around keeping people healthy. Um, Cause that was how they kept their costs down. Yeah. I think we'll learn a lot about this in the coming months. Like I'm now trying to think back to the actual doctor's, I know like two examples that come to mind. One is the doctor I had back when I was at um, a postdoc at Cornell. That doctor, uh, 10 years later, I was looking for my immunization record. So I looked him up to mm-hmm. you know, call his office and he had shut his practice and had posted a letter saying he's completely disillusioned by the healthcare system and how the managed care, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, the usual rant. And he was just actually quitting. So this guy at that point, he would have been in his early fifties. And Mm -hmm. I do remember back then it made sense. Like my interactions with him when I was actually under his care, he always seemed kind of like depressed and gloomy. And even though he was a good doctor and uh, took good care of me, he struck me as having like a very depressed attitude. And it made sense later that he quit for that. So that's my doctor example, number one. And the other is another doctor I made friends with recently here in LA. Uh, He quit. Uh, like sort of regular frontline practice and uh, started uh, working for a telemedicine. So he's a neurologist. So he now does telemedicine for uh, uh, neurology. So he's a neurologist in operating theaters, but remotely. And he said one reason he did that was that he became disillusioned with like the actual being in the front lines of the healthcare system in present. So he wanted to retreat as far as possible. So two forms of exit, one actually quitting the profession entirely and another exit like going remote which is kind of interesting. Like so many of us are now in remote state. But yeah, exit. Yeah, uh, yeah M for medicine. We'll circle back on this too, I guess. <laughs> right, even yeah. you put that on I, uh, I knew, did I? Was that me? Are you sure that wasn't you? I like, uh... Oh, was it? But you were excited about talking about it at least. I do get excited about talking about evilness. Um, okay, yeah. So I'll talk about evil. So the the unspoken unspoken tagline of this um, unspoken because I don't think we've ever said it before, at least not on the air. Of no, no, because this, this is your tagline. Slightly evil. Yeah, it used to be my tagline uh, until about I, I used to run a mailing list between I think two thousand nine to twelve called Be Slightly Evil, mm-hmm. and then I compiled that into an ebook and shut down that list. Uh, but that Be Slightly Evil tagline. Uh, I, it was a, a joke at Google's expense. When I came up with it, it was like, you know, <laughs> don't be evil. So mine was be slightly evil. And I did write a, quite a bunch okay. of things about it. But it's, it's honestly a very tongue in cheek thing for me. Like I think what I really mean by that is I'm pragmatic. I'm not idealistic. I don't have like mm-hmm. rosy eyed views of most people and I operate on those assumptions. But I don't think I'm actually, like it's not an axis I can easily readily classify myself on. Like maybe I'm, selfish and a little craven but i don't know that i'm actually anywhere on the evil spectrum what about you do you think you're evil i don't know that sounds like an evil hedge it's a hedge it's definitely a hedgy i don't think i'm evil i don't think i'm uh, yeah i don't know man i don't know i don't think so it seems like a hard thing to answer do you know anybody or can you think of anybody who you would unambiguously classify as evil? Like mm, Trump fit, for know. example, would you call Trump evil? Yes, I think Trump is actively evil. Okay. I also, but I think that some people behind Trump are more evil than Trump. I think that, um, I, you know, so my favorite way of tracking evilness is sound weird. Maybe we should talk about this under micro expression for M, but um, people's facial expressions, this is expressions, I guess this is emotions or expressionism. Um, the, there's like, a, so I don't know if this is actually like a theory, but I have a very strong, like personally developed theory around um, emotions and expressionism and like body, whatever. Let, um, let's talk about like, that in a second, but I wanted to throw in an E element there. E for Ekman, the guy who's famous for micro expressions is Paul Ekman. And his oh, stuff, yeah, 
the, the TV show Lie to Me was based on his work. So Ekman, E for Ekman. But um, I'm sorry to disappoint you. It didn't replicate. Like his work turned out to be bullshit. Oh, like his, uh, I, uh, yeah. But the FBI okay, uses but it. Maybe it? there's some truth to it. It's like astrology level true. Yeah, it's astrology <laughs> level true. Exactly. Um, <laughs> Good for Scorpio. But Let's the uh, yeah, I think it's great. Uh, so the um, I, I love that TV show. By the way, I think I'm thinking of the TV show, the micro. I think it's where most of this came from. But um, I, pictures of um, they're not micro expressions on Kushner. Have you seen pictures of Kushner? His face is a picture of disgust. Like when you look at it and you're like, what expression is that human expressing right now? Like the way that his like eye and like he kind of gets this like his the nostril flare. Like it's just like this like very like he just looks disgusted. But it's like it's his face is set that way because it has been practicing that expression for years now. The man is just disgusted. He's just like, and you can see it on his face. Um, it's not micro. Like, that's not a micro expression. That's just his like resting bitch face is like disgust or like some amount of like just disdain. He's a disdainful motherfucker and it's written on his face. Um, so yeah, I do think that like being evil, like experiencing emotions registers themselves over the long term and your resting facial expression and I think you can spot evil people by their faces. Um. So, um, yeah, a couple of um, thoughts in response to that. Like when you were talking, the immediate uh, thought that came to my mind is uh, the picture of Dorian Gray. Did you ever read that novel? It's a very yeah. short novel. So uh, yeah. the idea that uh, you can live this depraved evil life, but it won't show in your face because it's showing up in the portrait that struck me as like a really interesting metaphor. So uh, that, to me, that uh, lends a note of caution to your um, sort of heuristic equation of uh, uh, you know, the, what, uh, the way I understood what you were saying is your overall sort of emotional attitude and evil attitude or whatever, if, if you hold it sort of consistently enough, it'll start being reflected in your face. And that's kind of how you get a resting bitch face or whatever you're equal and maybe resting saint face or whatever it is that you have. Uh, that's also yeah. true. Like there's people who are really fundamentally good and they have like a resting saint face, you could call it, right? So that's yeah. one thing that comes to mind. <laughs> but the other thing that comes to mind is you kind of want to be cautious because some people might just have facial structures that um, you could easily misread as uh, evil or something. Like um, maybe this mm, is not okay. as true, but... Uh, like all the people who play villain roles in Hollywood, are they all villainous? Like some of them are really good at it, right? Like uh, some are interesting. Like one guy I really like is, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, the Mexican guy who plays uh, Machete. Have you seen those movies? Machete. No, I don't think so. um, but he, he's an ex-con. He, he went to prison, but he's, a, he's an awesome guy. So he has this totally lined scarred face and he's just a scary dude and it's like all right that kind of reflects the life he's uh, led as well and the roles he plays in hollywood movies um, so that's an example that supports your thesis but then there's probably examples of uh, oh yeah the guy who plays snape in the harry potter movies um alan rickman is that him yeah he yeah. played a lot alan of rickman. characters yeah. and he died recently but he's a from what i've heard one of the nicest yeah. people ever right so i don't know how much how much you can read into this correlation uh, but but um, I think I'm mostly with you where this, this certainly but okay but if you okay but here's the thing I think the key is you take a picture of a person and you like ask yourself what is what like not even thinking of anything you say okay just looking at the expression expression on their face not like the lines and stuff but like the actual physical expression and what is that emotion that they're experiencing I think that's like I think that's a fair way to go about it, if that makes sense. Okay, so if you're, if you're not going all the way to like um, personality attribute judgments like good or evil, but only like disdain, I think is the one you used for Kushner, right? Like disdain or contempt. Okay, so that, that I think is a reasonable level extrapolation. It's like, all right, this person's default emotion is disdain or contempt. I think that's right. reasonable. Uh, and and that's what I think, you should look to read in people's faces is emotions, right? Yeah. So like, yeah. Oh, uh, have you read, um, oh, this was... Um, so you, 
you thought Tiago's talk at Refactor Camp, right, on Lisa Feldman Barrett's um, work on uh, emotions? I did, yeah. Yeah, so that, that's relevant here, right? Because her work, I think the takeaway from Feldman's theory of emotion is our sort of uh, taxonomic theory of emotions, like the six basic uh, emotions of happiness, sadness, disgust, surprise, mm -hmm. whatever. That's kind of bullshit. It's like um, the sort of a culturally constructed aspect to the vocabulary we impose on emotional range. But I think your, your theory is kind of robust to that because it kind of doesn't matter whether you label it contempt or disdain. There's probably sort of a, at a more fundamental level, you're sort of associating personality with a standard emotion, right? It, it kind of doesn't matter what the classification is. No. Okay. All right. So what, do you have other examples like people whose faces you read as resting X face where X is some negative, horrible emotion? Um, so Zuckerberg recently went to, <laughs> uh, he recently showed up in front of Congress to testify and um, there was some great videos of him responding to questions. Um, his face is so devoid of emotion. It's so flat. His face is so flat. Like people are like, oh, he looks like a robot. And it's like, why do they think he looks like a robot? The reason he looks like a robot is because he, is, he, he has learned to manipulate his facial expressions as so as not to give away what he is feeling. I don't think it's that he doesn't feel things. I think it's that he, anyway, I mean, this is like, so then I'm like constructing a narrative around his facial expression, which is like definitely, I think on the like astrology yeah. level of- um, No, this one I think is actually important whatever. because um, uh, you see it in a lot of people in a lot of people in powerful positions. Yes. They are low reactors. So the term I think you're looking for is low reactor. Like every- mm -hmm. Oh, like, he reacts though. He reacts. You can watch his eyes twitch. Yeah. He'll make the mic. So like- there was a point in the video where you could like go like frame by frame and find his reactions. He's just, but then you can also watch him smooth it back out again. If that makes sense. So it's not that he's not reacting. He, he has just trained himself not to show it on his face, um, which I think is interesting. Yeah. And I think a lot of people have do that and a lot are a lot better at it. Like I think Cheryl Sandberg, speaking of Facebook executives, she's actually got a much more controlled affect than he does. But the example I really love for talking about this, and this was actually one of my newsletter issues in the old Be Slightly Evil list, mm. which was, uh, mm. I think the title of that particular newsletter, I remember it was The Art of Cold-Blooded Listening. So this is a chapter in the book. Uh, I'll send you the ebook later. Um, but uh, the example I used there was um, Glengarry Glenn Ross. Have you ever watched that movie? Mm -mm. So Glengarry Glenn Ross is... Um, uh, the premise is it's a bunch of salespeople who are competing over leads to close sales in real estate or something. But there's a famous bit where you know, one of the kind of losers in the sales team, he's angry at the whole organization and he goes into this huge rant, angry rant at his bosses and the boss is Kevin Spacey mm -hmm. and, and the target of the rant. Like this guy is basically abusing Kevin Spacey for like five minutes and Kevin Spacey has this completely impassive look and at the end of it, he just has one response, which is he picks up on the one thing the guy reveals in the five minute rant, which is actually an exploitable weakness he's revealed. It's like, oh, how did you know that one thing that proves that you went in that thing and stole the leads or something like that? So that's the plot element. I'm giving it away. But to me, that's cold blooded listening. And it's, it's like the mm -hmm. method acting version of low reaction. So being a low reactor means you're controlling your affect. But being a cold-blooded listener means you're going deeper than that. It's like method acting where it's like you don't let what the other person is saying even penetrate your identity or self-image or whatever. You are listening for sort of actionable, you know, tactical leverage to use against that person in the competition with them. And that to me is like the deeper level of the game. And if you can pull that off, you have the necessary conditions for being evil. You may not be evil. Yes. In that movie, Kevin Spacey is not evil, but he's certainly a sociopath. So, right. yeah. Right. So I guess this is why when you're like, so this is, so I guess, so I think that, so I think that Kushner versus Zuckerberg actually makes a good illustration of why I think, why you could say, well, Lisa, Kushner's face, clearly contempt, that, 
that's an evil thing to be feeling at a whatever or whatever. Or like, that's just like, just like, Oh, why do our public officials feel contempt for X, Y, Z? Like, like that I think is a very understandable thing that why that's evil. But then you be like, well, Zuckerberg just doesn't react. So like, why is that an evil affectation? Exactly. Like what you're saying in terms of um, the ability to not react in situations is something that people use as an, like as an edge, like it's not, they're not being present with you. They're using it as an ability to gain an edge in a situation, I think. So lack of expectation, especially one that's trained, I think is like, a, it's, a, it's a marker of like the capacity to commit certain evil acts, I think. Oh, Venkat, I think, I think your audio cut off. Did you mute yourself? Yeah, yeah sorry, I was muted for a second. Uh, I was just saying, I'll withhold comment on that particular example. Uh, but I will say that in general, important executives do tend to be disproportionately low reactors and a significant proportion of them are sociopaths and a significant proportion of the sociopaths are also evil. So there's like, almost a great filter hypothesis kind of thing going on where you have this equation of constants, all of them less than one multiplying the initial affect. Like you look at somebody, you see their default X expression and you make certain inferences from that. And there's a chain of inferences you can make all the way to are they good or evil. And I think that's actually, actually reasonable, even though Paul Ekman's micro expressions thing may be bullshit, I think, um, reading affect and sort of making judgments based on that is a legit thing to do. Yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah, I definitely think it is. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, uh, on that note, I think we should uh, perhaps wrap it up. Um, it's been an excellent conversation, I would say. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was uh, a lot of fun. I think we went longer than we usually do. But yeah, it's covered a lot. We went a lot longer. All right. Uh, great. All right. Cool. All right. Well, it was uh, always a pleasure, Venkat. Thanks for coming on our show, Scorpio Season. Always a pleasure, Lisa. Glad to have you on our show. And we'll see you all next time. Sounds great. All right. Ciao.